Perhaps you heard the story about the 84-year-old man who got engaged to the 80-year-old woman. One of their first stops since they were beginning to plan for their wedding, they went to a drugstore and asked for a meeting with the drugstore manager. The gentleman said to the manager, do you carry ACE bandages here? And the manager said, yes, we do. Well, what about uh, dental cream and x lax and Tylenol PM? And the manager said, well, we carry all that. He said, what about uh, ibuprofen and uh, walkers? So we carry ibuprofen and we carry walkers. Are, are you wanting these items? And the gentleman, the 84-year-old man said, well, in a sense, yes. You see, uh, this is my fiance. She's 80 and, and I'm 84. And we're just looking for a good store where we can register for our wedding gifts. Thank you. Well, if you know what it's like to stockpile in anticipation of weakening days, boy, you're going to love this promise from the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. It states simply, Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This is just one of several thousand promises that populate the scripture with the purpose of giving us a firm place to stand as we pass through life. We're looking at simply a sampling of these promises with the hope that we will develop the habit of creating our own list of promises and standing on those promises rather than standing on our pain or our, our standing on our problems. And each week we look at a promise and we look at a story that parallels that promise. And this one is one of my favorites. But before we look at the promise, let's do what we do each week. If you're watching online, if you're looking, uh, watching the message from one of the campuses, we're so thrilled that you're a part of this. Each week we sit up straight, we put our shoulders back, and we fill our lungs with air and our heart, hearts with hope, and we say this like we mean it. Are you ready? Here we go. We are building our lives on the promises of God because his hope we stand well done. Thank you, Father, for promises. Thank you that you are a promise maker, but most of all that you're a promise keeper. Grant that we can understand this wonderful promise that you're sticking up for us and standing up for us right now. Open our hearts to receive the implications of this promise. Forgive our speaker. His sins are too many to count. Grant that we can see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. We might assume the storms would have stopped. After all, Jesus was on the planet. He invented storm systems. He created the whole idea of atmosphere and, and wind and rains. We might assume that for the time he was on our planet, that the earth would be storm free, that God would suspend the laws of nature and spare his son the discomfort of blowing wind or stinging rain, or at the very least, that God might allowed Jesus to walk around the earth in a bubble, kind of like the one the Pope has when he drives through a crowd, some kind of protective shield so that Jesus would never get soaked, so that he'd never be afraid, he'd never get cold, he'd never be windswept. Jesus should be spared the storms of life, and so should we. Lingering unspoken among the expectations of many Christians is this. Now that I belong to God, I should get a pass on the problems of life. I'm here to help other people face their storms. I live to help them, but face my own? No. To follow Jesus is to lead a storm-free life, right? Well, that expectation crashes 
quickly on the harsh rocks of reality. The truth of the matter is life comes with storms for all people. And Jesus was speaking to disciples when he said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation. Storms come. They come to you. They come to me. And they even came to the first followers of Christ. If you like to fill in the blanks, the first item is the power of the storm. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. You know, sometimes we create our own storms. We drink too much liquor. We borrow too much money. We hang out with the wrong crowd. Consequently, we have to endure trouble of our own making. But that wasn't the case in this storm. They were on, the disciples were on a storm-tossed sea because Christ bade them be there. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, it says. So this isn't Jonah trying to escape God. These are disciples seeking to obey Jesus. Uh, These are missionaries who move overseas only to have their support evaporate. This is the couple who honors God in their marriage only to have an empty crib. This is a student who prepares only to fall short in his studies. This is the Christian businessman who always takes the high road only to be outbid by dishonest competitors. These are disciples who launch a boat just as Jesus told them to only to find themselves sailing headfirst into a tempest. So storms come. They even come to the obedient. And they come with a punch. Look at this. The boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the autumn and winter months, cold maritime air has a way of pushing into the Mediterranean basin and colliding with tropical air masses, and it creates eddies of low pressure that funnel out of the ravines into the Galilean basin. So storms on the Sea of Galilee can be fierce. Jesus had dismissed the crowds and told the disciples to get into the boat at the evening hour. It was John who was in the boat who later told us when they had rowed three or four miles, the storm hit. Evening became night, night became windy, and before long, the disciples in this boat were riding the roller coaster called the Sea of Galilee. This five-mile trip should have taken less than an hour, but here they are, John also tells us, at 3 a.m., still far from shore. Now, they deserve some credit. They're still rowing. They didn't turn around and return to land. They persisted in obedience. They kept digging the oars into the water and pulling the craft across the sea. And if you're in a storm, let the disciples give you some examples here. Maybe that's all you can do is just keep putting one foot of faith in front of the other. If so, you're doing the right thing even though they were fighting a losing battle because the storm left them too far from the shore, too lost in the struggle, too small in the waves. If you were to climb in the boat with the disciples at this moment and look at the faces of the followers, what expressions would you see? Would you not see some fear? Would you not see some doubt? And if you were to listen Perhaps you might hear one of the disciples cry out over the wind, Hey, has anybody seen Jesus? Because you see, Jesus did not get into the boat with them. They sailed into the storm, and Jesus is not in the boat. That question is not recorded in the text, but I have to believe it was asked in the boat. It was asked then, and it's asked today. We find ourselves in storms. And we look around and say, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus when the waves are high? Where is Jesus when the winds are stiff? Where is Jesus when the night is dark? Where is Jesus when death seems imminent? The answer is clear and surprising. Praying. This is point two. Look at the prayer 
of the Savior. Jesus went up on a mountainside by himself to what? To pray. And there's no indication he did anything else. No reference to him eating, to him chatting, to him napping, to him going on a stroll. He didn't do anything except pray. And he was so intent in prayer that he persisted even though his robe was soaked and his hair was matted. He had served all day and now he prays all night. He felt the gale force winds and the skin stinging rain. He too was in the storm and so he prayed or he was in the storm and that's why he prayed. Could it be that the storm is the reason for the prayer? Could it be that the storm on the Sea of Galilee is symbolic of all the storms that happen in our lives? And could it be that the image of the disciples bouncing in a boat is simply an image of of you bouncing in your struggles? And could it be that this story is in the Bible for, among other reasons, to tell us where Jesus is and what he is doing when we find ourselves in a storm? What is the first course of action when a storm comes upon his followers? Jesus chooses to pray. Jesus is at the right hand of God and is also what? Interceding for us. This is a stout verb in Greek. When it appears in the New Testament, it always refers to persistent and insistent and specific requests. For example, in the book of Acts, we read about Festus, the governor of Judea, who is explaining to the king about the appeals of the people regarding the apostle Paul. He says, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has, here it is, petitioned me, interceded to me about him in Jerusalem and here in Judea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. So this is a passionate request. It's a specific request. So biblically speaking, this is what intercessors do. They offer passionate and specific requests before God. And this is the promise of Scripture. For some of you, this will be the first time anybody's ever told this to you. And I'm so privileged to be the one to do so. But can you picture this? That right now, at this moment, in the midst of your storm, In the midst of your struggle, the almighty Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, having been given authority over all heaven and on earth, he is praying for you. Praying that you will not fall. Praying that you will not quit. Praying that you will not despair. Praying that you will not fall away. He is praying for you. The king of the universe is speaking up on your behalf. He is calling out to the heavenly father. He is urging the help of the Holy Spirit. He is marshalling the strength of the angels. He is advocating for a special blessing right now, advocating for a special blessing to be sent your way. You do not fight the wind and waves alone. You do not face this challenge by yourself. And it's not up to you to solve it. You have the mightiest prince and the holiest advocate standing up for you. When Stephen was martyred for his faith, before he passed into heaven, the scripture says he gazed steadily into heaven and he saw the glory of God And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Jesus stood up for Stephen. You ever had anybody stand up for you? Yes, you have. And his name is Jesus Christ. He stands up for you. And he's standing up for you right now. 
And he's crying out with all authority in heaven and on earth for strength to come your way. Grant Mary the strength to face this interview. Issue to Tom whatever is necessary for him to be a good father. Defeat the devil who would rob Allison of her sleep. Where is Jesus? The crew may have cried out on the Sea of Galilee. Where is Jesus? The enfeebled, the isolated, the lonely, the weakened, the sad, the impoverished, the overstressed, and the isolated cry out. Where is Jesus? Where is he? He's in the presence of God, speaking on your behalf. And he says to you what he said to the Apostle Peter. You might remember that on the night before the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus took Peter to the side because he knew that before the night was over, Peter was going to deny Christ. And knowing that the Apostle was about to be severely tested, here's what he said to Peter. He said, I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. Of all the things Jesus could do, and he could do anything. He could have protected Peter from the test. He could have told Peter about the test. But he chose instead to do the one thing he knew was the most important thing for him to do, and that was to pray for Peter. Can you believe Jesus Christ is praying for you? You ought to put that in your high school annual. Prayed for by Jesus Christ. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You see, when we forget to pray, Jesus remembers to pray. When we're full of doubt, Jesus is full of faith. When we're unworthy to be heard, Jesus is always worthy to be heard. Jesus is a sinless and perfect high priest and when he speaks all of heaven listens unshakable hope is the firstborn offspring of this promise we'd like to know the future but we can't we'd like to see the road ahead but we can't we'd prefer to have every question answered and every problem solved but jesus thinks it's more important for us to simply know this I'm praying for you, he says, and that's all you need. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the prayers of Jesus are heard in heaven? Do you think the prayers of Jesus have effect in heaven? Do you think the prayers of Jesus have a powerful impact on the future? The answer to that question, in case you need to know, is yes, yes, and yes. So do you think you're going to make it through this storm? Not because you're strong, but because Jesus is. Not because you're faithful, but because Jesus is. Not because you never stumble, but because Jesus does not. And because of him and because of his prayers, you're going to make it through this storm. Would you please receive that right now? Somebody's hearing me talk right now who has been fighting such despair over the last few days, right on the edge, holding on by fingernails. You're wondering if you're going to make it the bold and undiluted and unquestioned answer from Christ. Is yes, you will. You will. Yeah, someone might object. If Jesus is praying for me, then why do I have any problems at all? I mean, if Jesus is praying, wouldn't the intercession of Christ guarantee a storm-free life? Again, the answer to that is yes. And that storm-free life will begin the first second of the new kingdom. But between now and then, we live on a fallen planet in a fallen society populated by people who are red rebels and radicals against the cause of God. Consequently, there is a cancer of sin that sits upon our earth like a cloud. And then there's also the devil himself who prowls around like a lion just looking for people he can take to hell with him. Consequently, between now and then, we're going to have troubles. 
And so the presence of the praying Jesus does not guarantee the absence of problems. The presence of the praying Jesus simply guarantees that we will persevere in spite of the problems. Indeed, the presence of the praying Jesus states that God will take the problems and use them for good. My friend Chris was nine years old when he was diagnosed with a severe case of mononucleosis. And the doctor told him that he would have to spend the entire summer at home indoors. Can you imagine a nine-year-old boy being told he couldn't go outdoors all summer? Chris was athletic, rambunctious, loved life. And here the doctor was telling him that the summer was going to come and go and Chris would not be able to ride his bike, would not be able to fish, would not be able to play Little League Baseball. For a nine-year-old, and really for anybody, but especially a nine-year-old, this was a Galilean storm. Chris's father owned a pharmacy. Chris's father was a man of God. And Chris's father began praying, Lord, there has to be good to come out of this. Just so happened that Chris's father sold guitars in his pharmacy, and he wasn't a half-bad guitar player himself. So he came up with an idea. He brought a guitar home, and he presented it to nine-year-old Chris. And every morning... Before going off to the drugstore, the father would teach Chris a new chord or a new technique. Well, Chris kind of took to it. And all of that time alone in the house with nothing to do, he used to learn like a boot camp in playing the guitar. Well, by the end of the summer, Chris was pretty good. He was singing Willie Nelson songs. And he had written a few songs himself. Within a few years, Chris was leading worship at churches. Within a few decades, he was called the most sung songwriter of this generation, perhaps of all history. Maybe you'll recognize the names of some of his songs. How Great Is Our God, Holy Is the Lord, Jesus Messiah, You see, I can't help but think that Jesus was praying for nine-year-old Chris Tomlin. He always lives, Scripture says, to intercede for us. In the midst of the storm, he is praying for you. And through the midst of the storm, he is coming for you. We only have time for one more point, but we can't stop without making this one, and that is the presence of Christ in the storm. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake, and when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Jesus became the answer to his own prayer. He turned the water into a walkway. He who made two walls out of the Red Sea for Moses, he who made the iron axe float and swim for Elijah, he transformed the Sea of Galilee into a level path and came walking through the waves toward the apostles in the midst and in the mist of the storm. Now they called him a ghost, but still he came. Peter's faith became fear, but still he came. The winds howled and raged, but Jesus was not distracted from his mission. He had a point to make. He stayed on course until he demonstrated that he and he alone is sovereign over all storms. He spoke the word, and those raging waves were as still as glass. 
and the disciples, for the first time in Scripture, did this. They worshipped him. They said, truly, you are the Son of God. And with the stilled boat as their altar and their beating hearts as their liturgy, they worshipped Jesus. May you do the same. Were it within my power, I'd take all the problems of life away from you, but it's not in my power. But I have been entrusted with the privilege of sharing this promise. And I want to speak to you who are passing through a storm. You are not alone. The presence of Christ is in the storm. The prayers of Christ are being heard for you during the storm. And soon you will see Christ himself coming for you to help you. And when you see him, may you do what the disciples did. May you worship. Amen. Father, this is our prayer. That you would help us to be faithful in the storms of life. You have been completely honest with us. You have been. You shot straight. You told us in this world you'll have tribulation. And so we're going to quit complaining that we have problems. We're going to start believing in your promise that you're going to use these problems to demonstrate your power. And you'll be the answer to your own prayer. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said.